All right, hi guys. Um, well, it happened again. Uh, I did a 35 minute inspired video yesterday on the subject. Uh, hopefully this is recording okay. I don't know what the hell's going on, but uh, yeah, I went back to the file and it was zero bytes. I'm using the indwelling video recorder on the um, uh, Acer Chromebook 11 and it takes decent videos, but uh, they changed up the software. Normally, like when you're done with a the video, there's a download sign where you can save the video. I'm thinking maybe I accidentally um, shut down the program before it had time to process the video. Hopefully this will work because I don't want to spend another 35 minutes uh, getting into this. The upside of this is that I can refine what I did the other day, which I will do, and you won't know the difference because you haven't seen one from the uh, other day. I'd like to begin with a shout out to Micah, Micah Millet or Millet, I'm not sure which is the pronunciation, for contributing to the cause of my further existence on the planet. It makes no sense to me at all, this phrase, cost of living, that I have to pay for my existence. It just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, the world is so bizarre. Any case, um, the music you just heard, uh, if you've been around the block in music, that is the chord progression to the Paco Bell Canon in D, not Taco Bell. It, Taco Bell Canon is a whole different affair that I can't go into, but the Paco Bell Canon, P-A-C-H-E-L-B-E-L, -E Canon, and a Canon, C-A-N-O-N, is actually a, uh, it's kind of like row, row, row your boat, that sort of thing, uh, where you layer lines over lines and they're re repetitive. Um, I think there's a better definition of that, like um, because uh, the Paco Bell Canon isn't, doesn't do that. It, do, it doesn't really kind of uh, state a melody and state a, a few bars later and, you know, that sort of thing, uh, like row, 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 row your boat does. You'll have to pardon me. I'm really tired. I got a shitty night of sleep last night. Anyway, the subject of today is uh, uh, music, magic, and mysticism. And uh, we're going to start out, uh, I want to talk about, um, first of all, you know that music is, is intimately intertwined with uh, the ritual, spiritual rituals of various cultures. Um, you have the Kowali singers of the Sufi tradition along with the Sufi Zikr, which is kind of singing, but definitely a lot of repetition in there. And we're going to broach the idea of repetition in a moment. Uh, music and ritual, African music. Um, Probably uh, uh, there is no culture on the planet that has such, um, that places such central importance on the music itself in terms of ritual. And believe me, the Africans have a ritual for everything. It's pretty awesome, actually. I went, once witnessed, um, I was playing with uh, Baba Tunde Olatunji's troupe, and he was a mystic. And um, uh, we were playing actually a wedding. We were hired to play a wedding. And... Um, it happened to be a half moon that night and they started off with this cool dramatic drum thing with this chanting and uh, it turns out that I asked him what that was about and he said, oh, it's a half moon ritual. So there's a ritual for the half moon. I don't know if there's one for the quarter moon and you know the three quarter moon, but definitely the half moon. So music and ritual, I mean, you could probably get off right off the bat, you could probably uh, get the idea that it's so important. Um, spiritual music, you could even go to gospel music and or the old church canons of, uh, you know, the early days of the church, uh, music and chanting was very, very important. And in fact, uh, I'll hip you later to the fact that there is actually a mantra that's used in Christianity. Uh, there are a couple of them. Uh, very rare, but there are mantras used in uh, Christianity. In any case, uh, let's flow over into this idea of repetition, okay? Uh, before I go, well, uh, all right. Repetition. Um, if you see if you've been to a rave, OK, and, you know, the steady uh, bass drum four on the floor beat that repetitive, constant pounding. All right. Repetition has a hypnotic effect. And um, when re repetition is taken to its really far extreme, uh, a person could experience a certain heightened awareness and uh, unusual effects. It could always uh, be used detrimentally as well in order to inculcate hypnotic ideas into people, which I believe that even in rave music, they're probably embedded in within the music or subliminals and stuff like this. Um, I, I wouldn't know for sure. I mean, you know, 
I had a th I had a really paranoid conspiracy theory that all synthesizers have embedded subliminals. So if you're totally innocent, you're still creating music with subliminals in them. That's really paranoid. But, you know, I wouldn't put it past those guys. And by the way, if they haven't tried it yet, if you guys want to pay me for this really great idea I have about how to control people, you know, uh, just give me a call. We'll work it out. OK, so anyway, repetition. Before I go into repetition, I want to mention one little side note here. First of all, keep an eye out. Uh, James Corbett and I are going to combine forces, me on the musical side, him on the research side. And of course, we both do a bit of each ourselves. I do a bit of research. He does music. So, uh, But we are going to put our uh, heads together and uh, do a podcast regarding uh, conspiracy theories around our favorite band, The Beatles. And uh, if you've been around the block as much as I have, you would have heard of the conspiracy theory that in 1966, Paul McCartney died in a car accident and they replaced him with a with a double. OK, it's an absurd notion, but it's a lot of fun. And uh, if you want to prepare yourself for this when it comes out, uh, go to YouTube and check out a series called The Winged Beetle. I think it's on. Uh, uh, I think they they their uh, YouTube handle is like uh, rotten, the rotten apple or something like that. But check it out. It's really, really fun stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, people were, in those days were doing things like playing revolution number nine backwards and when the when the guy on the record is saying number nine number nine you play it backwards and it sounds like turn me on dead man turn me on dead man which doesn't mean much but you know whatever um, however when we talk about repetition in music it's very interesting when we connect this with the beatles because there are a number of conspiracy theories not just paul is dead but that uh two different sources um one is the Tavistock Institute, and one is uh, Theodore Adorno, a German music theorist. Some people claim that Tavistock Institute wrote all of the Beatles music, or Theodore Adorno wrote all the Beatles music. It can be traced that he did apparently own the Beatles catalog for a couple of years in their early days. And I guess that made people suspicious. I'm not quite sure. Um, but he's a, he was a heavyweight music theorist, and he has this whole... It's interesting, like the connection, because it has this whole thing about uh, pop music and repetition. And uh, he was a he. The music he listened to uh, lacked repetition. He listened to to uh, composers like Wagner, who would kind of do a theme, then float off somewhere else, and do another theme and float off somewhere else. And you never got really much of a recapitulation of any uh, themes, or which necessitates a lack of repetition. So that's interesting. We'll go into that more. Um, where you find a lot of repetition, of course, is in the African music and in uh, the Middle Eastern Sufi Zikr. Now, before I talk about the Muslim religion, you know, uh, I've got to say something here. Like, it is my belief that every religion has an outer core that relates to moral principles. You know, we've all acknowledged that the uh, religions are trying to control us and make us behave a certain way. Uh, to some extent, uh, you know, not to apologize for them, but to some extent, humanity, it would have been total pure chaos if there wasn't somebody telling the world what's right and what's wrong and what you should do and what you shouldn't do, as in the Ten Commandments, you know. Uh, but in any case, I believe that every religion has an outer core of morality and an inner core of pure, true mysticism. Uh, and if I were to go through uh, various religions, I would say, like, for example, Tibetan Buddhism, the core would, uh, of that, the mystical core of Tibetan Buddhism would be the tradition known as uh, Dzogchen, uh, possibly Zen, too. Zen is almost an offshoot, but uh, Zen might also be the mystical core of Buddhism. Two possible ones on that count. Um, when you look at Islam, the mystical core of Islam was Sufism. And these guys were far from terrorists. They wrote love poetry. They were about music and love and peace, really. They were, you know, really early hippies, basically. Um, and in fact, they um, were always in trouble with the religious authorities in Islam because they did heretical things. Uh, one Sufi mystic uh, was stoned to death because he, would, he, um, he claimed that he himself was the truth. But what he was really saying was inside of any every human being, 
uh, is the truth or God. Um, so that, you know, uh, if we go to Christianity, we could say it's Gnosticism would be the mystical core of Christianity or possibly uh, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church or the Greek, I forget which, but I've read somewhere by a guy I'm going to mention later on. Um, it was either, I think it's the Russian Orthodox still has the original rituals that Jesus himself passed down to his disciples. So that's fascinating. Now, um, so uh, oh, Judaism, we have the Kabbalah, I think is the mystical core of Judaism. So I believe that this exists uh, in every religion. And in fact, there was a Star Trek that served for me as a profound analogy. Uh, apparently, little uh, genetic building blocks were scattered across these, you know, solar systems. And uh, there was a speculation that when, I don't know if they knew it was genetic, but it, there was a speculation that when you put this thing together, you're going to get some massive machine that's going to do something incredible, blah, blah, blah. So, of course, it was the Klingons against the Earthlings, against the, uh, who are the other bad guys, uh, the, uh, I forget their names. But in any case, there were three factions like clamoring to get pieces of this thing. And one would find one and one would find the other. And finally, Jim Kirk being kind of like the noble guy, while they're, they're fighting each other to get these, these pieces, Jim Kirk says, look, we all have a piece. Why don't we share what we have and see what happens when we put it together? And sure enough, they put it together and out comes this uh, holographic projection that says, you know, we are your progenitors and we created you. And what you picked up were various building blocks of your DNA um, that we scattered through the, out the universe. And you're actually all related. It was a great message, first of all. But when you talk about, say, the Kabbalah of Judaism and the Zen of uh, Buddhism and the Gnosticism of Christianity and the like, we're in an unprecedented time where... Um, the religions of the world can finally interact intensely and in which they have done and has caused all sorts of warring. But to me, if you took the mystical core out of each religion, it would be like that Star Trek. You put it together and you're going to find a profound universal message that connects us all. That's what I truly believe. Uh, but anyway, getting back on point, uh, this may be a long video. It was 35 minutes yesterday. And I'm yammering more right now than I did yesterday. So um, this is going to be long, probably about 40, 45 minutes. All right, anyway, so let's uh, continue on. Uh, the repetition in African music is pretty obvious if you play any African music. I love King Sonny Ade. He plays a style called Afrobeat, really cool. Uh, employs the pedal steel guitar. There's a whole story about that that's really neat. Um, that African music actually uses pedal steel, which is American country music uses it. And uh, there's an interesting connection there. Um, the Sufis, the, the, uh, what's called the, Zu, the Zikr, the remembrance of God, that's what it's done. Now, I have personal experience with this. I was involved in a Sufi group some years ago, and uh, we did um, this Zikr, this remembrance, and it was a lot like you, you sit and you move back and forth as you're chanting these mantras, kind of cultish, but I'm going to talk about cults in a minute. Um, in any case, it definitely, definitely put me in an altered state. There's no question about it. And sometimes I, I have like mystical experiences during these zikers. Um, so, yeah, repetition in music is important to evoke uh, a heightened state of consciousness. Now, I'm going to go back to the 70s for a moment here because... You younger folks, um, you don't have a context for a lot of what goes on. And just like I once said that if you weren't alive when the Beatles were around, you can't really fully understand the impact that they had on all of society. It was amazing. It was truly amazing. And also in the 70s, what had happened was you take all these hippies in the 60s that were taking acid and the ones that took it seriously, not as a party, but to self-explore, so to speak, we're having these tremendous mystical experiences and altered states of consciousness and higher consciousness and becoming one with the universe and all this other sort of thing. But when they come back, they come back to their usual old boring selves and they wanted to get back to what that was. And they, like George Harrison said, eventually they let go of the acid because they realized it was only 
a way of cleaning the windows off so you could see outside, but it's not a way to actually get outside. So um, uh, they were, America was importing a great number of gurus and Tai Chi teachers and spiritual people from all over the world. Uh, uh, I could name a few, Chagman, Chagyam Trungpa represented the Buddhist contingency. Uh, uh, Swami Muktananda and Yogananda both uh, represented the yogic community. Uh, um, there was uh, the Omega Institute, which represented the Sufis, which I thought it was kind of a watered down Sufism myself, but that's me. And then uh, also Idris Shah, of in, uh, who lived in London for quite a, a number of years, who was a very sober intellectual, also promoted Sufism in the West. There is still to this day an active uh, Sufi organization called the Nakshibandia, which exists in London uh, at the, as we speak. Uh, I think uh, they go under the category of intellectual Sufis. I wouldn't trust, trust their Sufism either. Uh, very much. In fact, there's not much spiritually I do trust, and the one I do trust, nobody would touch this one with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you about that guy later. But uh, when, so what happened is you had these spiritual guys. There was also Oscar Echazo who developed uh, the Arika Institute, uh, and I was part of that particular uh, organization. That was the my spiritual group I was involved with, also very cult-like. Um, but here's the deal now. So we have all these people imported, these spiritual people, and of course they're going to gather others around them, especially spiritual seekers that are trying to get what they got from the acid, but for real this time. So they're seeking and seeking and seeking. You know, it, uh, you had Alan Watts was a great Zen teacher. He really was a Zen master. He was quite something. Um, and then in the mid-70s, I began to feel a little threatened because there was this thing going on. There's this word that kept propping up the news called cults. And cults bad, cults bad, cults bad was the message. And then the CIA set up Jim Jones as a, as a cult. And uh, who else did they set up? Uh, I think they fucked with Rajneesh. And I believe uh, Osho Rajneesh was a true enlightened teacher. And I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, who was the other one? Oh, uh, Sun Young Moon, the Moonies. That was another one that I think was a CIA operation. Um, so when you see being conspiracies, uh, conspiracy theorists, I know there are those of you that sit within that category that watch this. Um, when you see something splashed over the television and the media and the news over and over and over again, you know they're trying to indoctrinate you into an idea. And in this particular case, it was cults bad, cults bad, cults bad. Bad things are going to happen. They're going to mind control you, all this stuff, right? Well, I think their reasoning behind that was when you get an enlightened human being, you get a free human being that's going to turn to the system and, and say, fuck you. I don't need you. I'm alive. I'm, a, I'm an awakened being, and I don't need your bullshit. Uh, a true enlightened master, whatever his needs are, will come to him through divine it's like a blessing or something like that uh, but divine miracles do happen now you know you guys really i'm giving you some really personal stuff here i don't normally talk about spirituality in my spiritual life in fact 90 percent of my friends i don't talk about this to whatsoever they have no idea what's really going on with me but i'm a very active spiritual seeker I do work every day to achieve the higher state of consciousness, and I fail every day. <laughs> all right. So in any, any case, uh, I was suspicious when all this news about cult bad, cult bad started coming out. And I just kind of um, didn't trust it. You know, and back in the 70s, you know, they were starting subliminals and stuff like that. I could see them. They were really obvious in those days. And I had an experience seeing a subliminal off the Johnny Carson show one day. And I, at the time I was in a therapy group and we, we went out to dinner after our therapy session. And uh, I brought up subliminals and this one woman said, yeah, I saw an image of, of Jesus with, skull, with the, like the skull and bones on it. And I said, I saw the exact same image. And I did. It was just very strange. It flashed for a second. Very strange. I've seen quite a few of those actually. So you can imagine from the 70s to now how well placed the subliminal uh, messaging has gotten 
pretty fucking scary that these people are willing to do this. Um, but fuck them. Anyway, uh, Rajneesh is an interesting case, and I wonder if uh, he has CIA plants. I know there were in the school I was in, there were CIA plants. Um, Rajneesh, um, I believe he was truly enlightened, but he had this woman that became his secretary uh, that uh, was pretty much a sociopath, and uh, she pretty much destroyed his ashram in Oregon. And uh, you, I'll tell you what, to get a perspective on it, go to Netflix and, and look for It's an amazing documentary called Wild Wild Country. It's in about five parts, but it's so worth it, and it's so so bizarre, so bizarre. Uh, but check it out. It's really interesting. Anyway, the school I was uh, involved in uh, appeared to be um, an outgrowth of um, the mystic philosopher George Gurdjieff. It turned out he, it, he really wasn't the exact uh, guy who influenced the school I was in. But George Gurdjieff presented a symbol called the Enneagram, which has now been turned into something as silly as like astrology or whatever. Uh, but the Enneagram was a heavyweight uh, symbol. And uh, the institute I was involved with used, used the Enneagram. But apparently Oscar Echazo got this from a different, another source than Gurdjieff. Um, in any case, Gurdjieff was considered to be what's called a universalist Sufi. A universalist Sufi means that... Um, they're also known as the uh, the beekeepers or the honeybees because uh, they go from plant to plant and extract the pollen to make the honey from each different flower, and then they bring it back home. Uh, each of those flowers would be a different spiritual tradition. Standard Sufism, non-universal Sufism, uh, you have to go through the door of Islam. There's no way around it. And right now, Islam is being decimated by the uh, Brits and the Americans. So, uh, I, you know, if you want to be a Sufi, I, I would say don't do not do that because you're going to be persecuted like fucking crazy. Um, but there is a universal Sufism that's kind of a hidden school that can only be accessed by very, very special means. Uh, now I'm going to go to this guy, George Gurdjieff. George Gurdjieff was the first guy that hinted toward this universal Sufism. Uh, there's a book called Meetings with Remarkable Men in which he recounts biographically he had formed a group called the Seekers After Truth, and they were precisely about that. In fact, that's one of the first references you'll see to, uh, uh, what is that, um, the, the uh, Legend of Gilgamesh, which is the, the one that was expounded on by uh, uh, Zechariah Sitchin. Gurdjieff was the first guy in the West to mention that document, and uh, they were in search of it. They were actually in search of it. In the course of their searching, they came to a, upon a monastery in uh, the Hindu Kush region of Af Afghanistan. And it was a very, very secretive monastery. And they managed to work their way into it and got shown some of the um, rituals and things like that that went on in this monastery. Very, very secret. It's referred to as the the Brotherhood is known as the Sarmoon Brotherhood or the Sarmuni. And uh, they are the beekeepers. Um, wow. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to sidetrack here. Uh, back in the eighties, a friend of mine gave me, it was a Xerox pamphlet called, um, what was it called? Uh, the Greater Sufism. And it had the symbol of the Enneagram and the honeybee on the back. And I thought, holy shit, this is it. This is that brotherhood that Gurdjieff was looking for. Somehow it's connected with this book. Uh, written by a, a guy named um, uh, Hodgson. I forget his first name. Um, Hodgson. Hodgson. Hodgson, uh, eventually, I actually uh, emailed this guy not, you know, 10 years ago or something like that. Because I got involved with the teacher who claims to be uh, the representation of universal Sufism at this moment right now. In other words, he's the kind of uh, chief of the Sarmuni, the, the head guy. And I actually got into email contact with this guy. And uh, he has websites on the, on the net. I'd give you a link, except what I'd say is this. Uh, if you want to look for it you'll find it. If you really want to look for it, you'll find it. But I'm not going to give his URL away. 
um, he had a number of websites under different URLs that had oracles and the oracles uh, um, were interactive. You click on them and they would kind of speak to you. Um, now they've all been uh, put under the umbrella of one URL. And uh, so that that's my little side note on that. But let's talk about Gurdjieff again. So Gurdjieff uh, had a cosmology that included um, the major scale. And when he talked about evolution, he said that's like the ascending scale. And you can hear all the work that goes into climbing up that ladder to finally get to, ah, okay. Involution, which would be, um, when we talk about evolution, evolution is the climbing higher, higher to the Godhead or to God. And involution would be the divine blessing that comes down from God into us, making things a whole lot easier. And that is the descending scale. Now, supposedly, I don't know how true this is, but Gurdjieff, when he was at this monastery, claimed that he got exposed to something called objective music. And what he claimed was that objective music has a profound impact on the psyche. It's kept very secret because it's so powerful. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but if you look at um, the Bible and the horn of uh, the wall of Jericho and the, the horn that knocked it down, I do believe that uh, sound vibrations can do a lot more than, uh, than uh, we know yet. And I think microwaves are part of that deal and ultra low frequency waves are being explored by our loving government, you know, to put it to good use, you know, for everybody's well-being. Um, all right. So we have ascension and descension in the musical scale. All right. Um, now, when I was involved in this uh, group, Arika, we had a Christmas tradition. And we would sing that Pockel Bell Cannon that I played at the beginning of this video. And there were all different parts. Like the, the guys would sing the bass part, and that would be Alleluia, Alleluia, and so on. And following the, the actual roots of the chorus, Alleluia. Uh, um, the uh, altos and sopranos would sing, um, the tenors, uh, tenors and soprano would sing in harmony. so forth. Um, when I was first exposed to this tradition, I listened to the music. And one thing that blew me away was every time the cycle rolled around to its beginning again, it was like a spiral. It just got higher and higher. And the, it snowballed. The energy got more and more and more intense. And it was like this overwhelming experience of the beauty of the human soul almost. Really quite something. Um, yeah, so um, my theory on this connected with Gurdjieff and the ascension and descension. If you've looked at some of my uh, uh, major minor key system videos, there's something called the line that I spoke about. And lines could either be overt or covert, that is apparent or hidden. And lines can either be chromatic, meaning uh, half step sequence uh, up or down, or they can be diatonic uh, in nature, which would be. Um, scale steps. Uh, you could have combinations, like you could have a, a covert diatonic or an overt chromatic or overt diatonic or like that. All right. Now, one thing I noticed about the um, Packel Bell Cannon was that it had a covert descending line, and that would be And then it goes up. And 
what that brought about was. And back. Um, now, one time I was at a party uh, of these people. Like I maintained, even when I got out of the Eureka School, when I moved to California, that was my social connection. And they had a really kind of well knit community, and I, I became part of it. And basically, we'd have these wild parties, really great parties. wasn't really spiritual stuff involved. It was just good old parties with dancing and rock and roll. Uh, but um, we used to have jam sessions, and I was, uh, God rest his soul, Bruce Langhorn. It was at his house. Brilliant, brilliant musician. Used to work with Bob Dylan and the like. Um, he heard me lay down the chord changes to, this was around Christmas time too, so it was perfect. I laid down the chord ch changes to the Paco Canon and D, but I did it in reggae fashion, which is, I did it in the third uh, cycle when I first exposed you to it in the beginning of the video was that. <laughs> So, of course, Bruce, loving the beat, just got right on the piano and started doing that. We had some uh, hand drummers. And before you know it, we got a little groove going. And, of course, this was the Eureka community, and they were familiar with this uh, Paco Bell Cannon. So it was a beautiful moment. Slowly, people in a semicircle gathered around the band, a little small band in the corner, and they start singing their separate parts to this, singing the Christian mantra, Alleluia which Alleluia is a really joyous, light-filled, heart-opening mantra. It makes you kind of love people, which is a positive thing. Um, the other, by the way, just a side note, the other um, Christian mantra I know of is, uh, it was actually made into a pop song in the 80s, but uh, that's Kiri, Kiri Eleazan. And uh, I think that might come out of the Gnostic uh, mystic tradition of Christianity. Probably if you go back to the Russian Orthodox Church, they'll have some other mantras as well. Amen. I just read recently from Yogananda that amen. Some people say it's from Egypt, but uh, the Hindus say no, no, no. It's older than that. It comes from Aum, Aum, Om, right? Uh, and was slowly changed over time. But yeah, one thing I was impacted by as a semicircle began to sing was, again, this incredible snowballing of energy. Every time it came around, it had more force and more power and more light, and more love, whatever the experience was. And I was just, I was overjoyed to be in that moment. It was just every once in a while, a person walks into a moment that is, feels like it's God given. The light is a little bit more lucid in the situation. And people seem to radiate. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience, but I certainly have, and it really is quite beautiful. Um, in any case, um, so it got me to thinking, uh, why does this piece keep snowballing, getting more and more beautiful and more and more beautiful? And then I realized it, it was the scale dissension. It was the blessing coming downward, the involution, the blessing com coming from the divine. <laughs> And uh, so that is, uh, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. And you know what, by the way, I did try to, uh, I'm going to take my cape off now. I did actually try to use this principle. I tried to build another chord progression that used dissension. Uh, mine wasn't as creative as Paco Bell, and it was more of a rock piece, but I did this progression. <laughs> pop music actually and sure enough when I played that song it had a similar snowballing effect so uh, there's something to the descending scale um, that somehow resonates with the human desire for contact with God and that feeling one gets when one feels one has been blessed by something higher um, by the way, too, the chord progression uh, of the Paco Bell Canon, I've heard it used in other contexts. And in fact, um, if you're uh, old enough to remember the, uh, the band uh, Blues Traveler from the late 90s, um, they had that killer harmonica player that was like virtuoso harmonicist. 
uh, they did a song, uh, The Heart Brings You Back, and it's almost exactly the same chords, all, except I'll tell you the one tiny little difference. That song went, um, oh, oh, it brings you back. See if I can sing in a higher octave, I doubt it. Oh, it brings you back. <laughs> I ain't telling you no lies. Now, the one difference is when they go to uh, the Pocketbook Canon, right now I have a capo on because, to, out of respect to Paco Bell, uh, the key uh, was D. Um, and uh, so I, I'm using a C-shaped form, as you can see. That's the easiest way for me to get the highlights of all the different lines in the song using the c shape. So I just took the take capo up to the second fret. That gives me the key of D using the key, uh, c shape. So I guess I should give you the actual Paco Bell chord changes, which would be D, A, B minor, F sharp minor, G, D, G, A. All right. Uh, Blues Traveler, when we get to that G, uh, when we get to that F sharp minor, they do an F sharp seven. All right. So the difference is this. That's the regular one. And then here's the uh, Blues Traveler. Which works actually rather nicely. And by the way, that song has a heart opening effect and what is he singing the heart it brings you back all right now if you want more references to the sufi influence in um western music um you can go to uh ravel's bolero and the lore behind ravel's bolero is that a, a very advanced sufi came to ravel and gave him the melody and the rhythms and said um you have to uh bring this to the west it's time for the west for this rhythm, and it was the bolero rhythm, which is and by the way, that is a profound piece of music, which also snowballs. Ravel, um, very interesting. That was the first, in a sense, I wouldn't call it minimalist, but it was the first piece to come out of classical music that employed extreme repetition. Uh, the audiences in those days had their ears tuned to, well, we're going to have first movement, second movement, recapitulation, blah, blah, blah. And here they hear the melody stated once, and it's, it takes a long time. It's about maybe 64 to 120 bars, something like that. But the cycle does come around that every 64 bars, come around and come around and repeat. Um, Now, a buddy of mine uh, told me that his experience of the bolero was that the, the actual rhythm the actual bolero rhythm was the sound of the earth turning. And that was just his poetic vision, but I loved it. I thought it was really cool. Um, all right, so at the end of, uh, I guess we're at the end of today. Uh, I, I think I touched on just about every point I wanted to touch on. I hope I didn't give you too much of a sneak preview about the Beatles conspiracy theory stuff. I hope James doesn't admonish me for that. Uh, and uh, let's see. Oh, I'm going to put some links down. Uh, I, what I'll do is I'll put a link to, um, uh, you'll hear my version of the Packable Canon, which I think I do it in G. I changed the key on my uh it's not there on my youtube site but i'll provide a link i'm going to give you a youtube link and this is important um for amateur uh, a four girl group called the four quarters and um i guess they could have shortened that to they could have called themselves a dollar but you know four, sorry okay anyway i'm um, they're they're amateur singers and they don't really sing on pitch very well but uh it's still adorable they're young girls and uh not it's not for the adorableness though to show you the potency of this chord progression even when it's not well uh presented like you know perfect technique and everything like that it still comes across as a very heart opening piece of music and in fact when i was in Eureka, none of those people sang really on pitch you know but s somehow when it built and built and built it it sounded like a choir of angels pitch or not 
All right. So uh, I'll give you links for that. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and the Bolero. I'll give you a good link for the Bolero. You should check out the Bolero. If you don't know, it's an awesome piece. Ravel was known for his ability to colorize, his ability to use instruments in such a way, like combining them and highlighting certain ones and all this that created these orchestral colors. He was known for being a colorist. And uh, the Bolero, it, it's a slow, long slope, but it builds and builds and builds. And when you get to the end, it's like this tremendous, it's like the doors of heaven are opening up. It's awesome. Um, all right, now I'd like to put in a plug uh, th again, thank you, Micah Millet or Millet, for your donation. If anyone cares to contribute to my cause, that'd be great because uh, all of my students have canceled like for day, like weeks, and uh, I am troubled about actually making the, the rent and buying groceries and crap like that. Uh, so, uh, if you'd like to contribute to my cause, I greatly appreciate it. You go to www.paypal.com and don't worry you don't need a oh no not not dot com let me start over you first of all you don't need a paypal account to contribute um it would be www.paypal.me as in me forward slash vincognito as in my youtube channel vincognito being one word um and if you'd like to contribute it i greatly appreciate it uh and that's it christmas is soon upon us uh I think I'm going to be doing a version of Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas Today on video, which I might post on my YouTube channel. I'll definitely post it on Facebook. And uh, that's it for today. Uh, if you celebrate Christmas, have a very merry one. Um, I'm spending mine alone. And don't feel bad for me. I, I, I'll, I'll feel bad for me. I got that job cut out for myself. So all good. All right, you guys. Be well. Peace, love, and may humanity finally learn to work together one of these days.